Well, the caption should not be like an alternative text of the paper. It should be simply the information necessary to understand fully the content of the figure of the table. Now, one, one little detail is that you usually want to be, so, be complete enough that people who are not reading the paper can read the caption. So, for example, write out scientific names. Uh, don't use the generic abbreviation, okay? Um, and you don't, you don't want to use any shorthand, you know, imagining that the person just read the paragraph above. So, so you need to be reasonably complete, but, but you also don't want the text to be longer than the figure. Okay, because the figure is your opportunity to give a visual. But they should be enough to stand alone. The yeah, paper. but just enough. Just enough. Okay. Yeah, and then something else very general is um, in relation to editing and scientific writing. I really want to do that. But I, I wonder if there's, you know, like, for example, yourself, did you have to go through some formal training on editing <laughs> or it's just a matter of practice and experience? I had a father who was an English professor, and I have a mother who was an expert typist and, and um, you know, way beyond typist, uh, just an expert with, with handling text, even though it was all on paper and typewritten. Um, and just all the time we were growing up, it was all about, you know, is that really in final form? No, take a look <laughs> at it. <laughs> When we were growing up, my father would arrive and he would say, uh, Moses, I have a word for you. And you'd say, oh, really? And my father would say, it costs 50 cents. Okay. And so you would go to your room and find 50 cents, come back, give it to him, and then he would give you the definition, the spelling, he would use it in a sentence, and he would tell it you why it was relevant to you. So. It, it's just something I've done all my life. A matter of practice. Yes. But there's also, and I say this about, about the entire set of people with whom I work, I definitely see a subset of those people who get a little lazy because they know that when I get to the manuscript, I'll do that detailed reading. And... I am not looking at you. <laughs> I'm actually, let's see, which way is west so that I can look towards Kansas? Uh, no, I mean, I have colleagues who are professors who don't bother with the literature cited because they know I'll take care of it. And I actually don't like that. You know, I, I get grumpy when I realize they're doing that. Um, I really think that not just to catch inconsistencies and errors, but also to make your writing flow better, it's really important to let a day or a week go by. <laughs> Forget about that manuscript after you've finished writing it. And then go and just sit and read it carefully. And I think that makes a huge difference. The biggest part is putting it aside. Yes. Because you've looked at it so many times, you know what you meant to say, you know what you've written, and so you can't see Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Alex. Okay, perhaps my question should have come earlier, but I can see in your letter a ah. place for title. Yes. Um, well, when I was growing up, I was told title should be direct and very straight to the point. But as this, you see a lot of titles being very philosophical. I don't know if it's the trend. Also, another thing is keywords. Uh -huh. Well, I was taught not to include keywords, uh, not to include words in the title as part of my keywords. But you see the trends changing these days. What's <coughs> the current? Okay, those are good <laughs> questions. For the title, a lot of that is driven by the journal. You know, if you're going to publish in science, they want something that's more of a headline. Right? You know, biodiversity is disappearing. Or, you know, but they, they really want you know, something that you would read in the newspaper. Um, 
Whereas if you're publishing in ecology, it needs to be kind of very precise and specific about what it is you've done. Um, so I think in large part, title is determined by the journal and essentially what does it take to describe fully the content of your paper. So I can't remember the precise example, but the other day I found what looked like a really interesting review paper of some phenomenon because it had this very general title, you know, you know, the, I don't know, something very general that looked very relevant. And so I downloaded the paper and when I started reading it, it was about that phenomenon in one country. You know, and so you can't do false advertising. Now, as far as title and keywords, keywords I'm guessing are going to start going away because more and more I mean, they were there for searching and for indexing, more and more the search engines can see the full text, or at the very least, the full abstract. But I can see the point that, you know, at least in the older system, title and keywords are your opportunities to get indexed under all of the relevant boxes, or in the, all of the relevant boxes. So repeating <coughs> words between the two would be kind of wasteful. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, but I kind of think as the title is, as being more informative about what you're doing and the keywords, you're thinking about something different. You're thinking about what will people search on who should be seeing my paper, okay? So I think it's kind of two different questions. Yes, yeah, Alex. Um, like in Africa or in developing countries, you find that most of the research is driven by kind of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Today, if we can say most of the projects are climate change or biotechnology. And for me, I'm in the field which is not having that current kind of research, but I find it a lot of information is missing in that field. And I want to publish my papers. Uh, when I publish these papers, are not, they are not cited as often like climate change related things. I'm um, is somehow cheated. Like if he says <laughs> in his country they rank or they give those ranks depending on how your papers are being cited in the journals. Is it <coughs> kind mm -hmm. of unfair? Uh, perhaps, which is to say there are fields where, you know, what are, you know, the average researcher in the field has more or fewer citations just because of the dynamic of that field. You know, if I'm working on insect taxonomy, well, it's really only gonna be the people who happen to work on that same family or genus who are gonna be citing me, okay? Whereas if I work on climate change, people around the world are interested in my work in some sense. Unfair, it's the game. It's always been that way, you know? Um, so in that sense, I don't, I don't think I'd, I'd go so far as to use such a, a strong term. Um, a good academic system is going to take those differences into account. Now, it doesn't mean that we all have good academic systems, uh, but a good one will be pondering the fact that you know, somebody in art history or in you know, systematics of some obscure group of, of you know, microlepidoptera or something like that is going to have a different citation rate from somebody who works on you know, the origin of the universe or dinosaurs is another favorite. So I, I don't know that I'd go to unfair. It's the reality. Okay? Just to finish with the, the cover letter, I usually just finish with Basically, I hope you like it and let me know if you need any more information. Now, that is definitely a minimalist cover letter. Um, there are many people who um, will say, no, what you really should do is include a paragraph or more that argues essentially why the paper is important. And um, certainly, you know, for science, nature, things like that, 
your first challenge is not getting the paper accepted. Your first challenge is not getting that email that Lindsay and I got yesterday, which is, guess what? Your paper is not even worth reviewing, we think, right? In our quick and dirty culling. Um, so certainly at that level, you do have to include some level of justification. A paragraph. Um, for normal journals, I feel it's a matter of choice. Um, some people do it, some people don't. Do be very careful not to overstate the importance or the impact of your results. Don't say this is the first time ever that anybody has ever done this, if it might not be, okay? Or if some people might interpret it as the first and some people might interpret it otherwise. So. Again, this is, this is a, a decision that each person makes. I personally would rather go with this letter. Okay, here's another interesting one. Some journals, now perhaps many journals, ask you to recommend some reviewers. And this is a strange thing because these, you're supposed to be recommending people who are going to evaluate your work independently. So the easiest thing is, you know, recommend your mother or your children, your father. You know, hopefully you don't have the same last name. Um, but this is, this is a, a really interesting and intriguing situation to be in, okay? Many journals allow us to make suggestions. The suggestions are sometimes <laughs> optional, and, some, and many times now they're required. And the editor may or may not follow your suggestions. So if I put down, you know, my mother's name, they'll probably see that we have the same last name and might guess that we're related. And so probably the editor will not send the paper to my mother for review. Um, but also, you know, you shouldn't recommend people who are at your institution. You shouldn't recommend your best friend. Um, recently there have even been discovered some reviewing rings. So imagine get four friends together and each of you recommends the other three as reviewers, and you all agree to be nice to each other's papers. This actually was written up in Science just a couple months ago where there was a, a ring of reviewers. Yeah, I think they, they hit the same journal too frequently. I think that was the problem. Um, now, in the very best of situations, an ideal reviewer is knowledgeable in your field, established in your field, you know, not an undergraduate or you know, another graduate student, um, has no relationship to you, either genealogical or, or personal, um, and has no, no coincidence with you in institution or in any way such that your getting the paper published makes that person look good. Right? Not always possible. Sometimes there are only two or three experts in the world and oops, you published a paper with that person. And that can be interpreted as a conflict of interest. But when you're working in a small field, sometimes that is unavoidable. And so if you want to be completely clear and above board, you say, I recommend this person, expert in the field, da, da, da. I recommend this person who is a colleague of mine and we have written papers together, but I feel that this person has a unique viewpoint. Okay? Obviously, I can't say, and I recommend my mother, even though she's my mother, she'll give you a good, clear recommendation, right? But I, I think being honest and open about any potential conflicts of interest is very important. 
This is what I just told you. Shouldn't have conflicts of interest. Don't uh, recommend your friends. And when you review things, you should also go back to the editor. You know, the editor comes in and asks you to review a paper that your mother wrote. And you should say, well, you know, she is my mother. And the editor may say, oops, sorry about that. You know, I'm, I'm caricaturing this. But when there is the potential for a conflict of interest, you should go back to the editor and say, um, you know, there is this potential conflict up to you. You decide. Then the other side of the coin is, every so often, there is the opportunity to remove reviewers. Now, again, the editor does not have to pay attention to your request. He or she can ask for a, re a review from that person. But at the very least, when they get back that vicious, scathing review, the editor is going to take that into account in interpreting it. But you should be very objective. It shouldn't be, you know, I just don't like Arturo. He's a mean guy. But maybe Arturo was just being rigorous about criticizing the piece of garbage of work that you sent in, right? But you really should be clear and objective about are there people out there who would be logical reviewers for a particular paper who you feel are not able to be objective about your work? I mean, I read a lot of papers by a lot of people who aren't my best friends, but I try to be objective, okay? Um, so this is, this is something that you should not do very often. But every so often you'll get into a, a situation where, you know, maybe unfortunately there's a race to finish a particular project. And if your paper goes to that person, that person may make inappropriate use of your results. Or maybe your advisor had a screaming fight with the person last week. Well, maybe that's going to color that person's view of you. Or simply jealous. Huh? Or simply jealous of you. It could happen. There is jealousy sometimes. <laughs> so, but this is not something that you should do very often. OK. Let's go even to tougher issues, <coughs> authorship. So there are some papers that look like this. You've seen me talk about Colwell a bunch of times. Colwell and Futuma, um, two authors. My understanding is that both of them con contributed to this paper. In other situations, you get something like this. OK, all of those authors. There are some papers that have 300 authors. Now the question is, what did that person do? What did uh, Gopal Murthy do? Or what did Scott Krauss do? It may well be that each one of them did something crucial. And science is increasingly collaborative in nature. Well, that would be unfortunate. Right, but I, I have lots of friends that I don't include as co-authors. I would say that's not appropriate. Did they contribute intellectually to the publication? That's my opinion. Uh, this is an interesting paper. Uh, I guess this was just the generation before Kate and Lindsay came into the group. I came in right as that project was getting finished. Okay. This is a working group at the University of Kansas. It's been going on for about seven years now. Um, eight or nine major papers. And essentially what we do is once or twice a year we pick a topic 
and we start working on it, you know, working in the sense of reading, and then designing a test or designing a study. They're usually things that are methodological because we all have our organismal biases and things like that. And we all work together for six months or a year. And at the end of it, we have a manuscript. And when we have that manuscript, somebody sends around the question, here is everybody in the group, and it's this long list. Who wants to be an author? Sounds strange, doesn't it? But what we're really saying, and everybody knows this, what we're really saying is, who feels that he or she has contributed significantly and really should be an author? And one thing that I've been very proud of in the group is that people have, I think in every paper we've written, people have said, no, you know, I was really busy this semester. Leave me off. You know, Kate said that a couple of times. Uh, but it's, it's an honesty. You do not want to have a CV with a long list of papers that you didn't do anything about, right? <laughs> the other thing that we do in this group is we take the list of names and we put a random number generator on it and we press the button, and that's the order of authors. And so the two professors are there and there, okay? But the idea is that we all contributed to it. So why should people be an author? Well, certainly writing the paper, providing critical ideas, or working hard on something. Okay, to me, those are the three key elements. Then there are some other possibilities. The lab group, some people call it PI, principal investigator. Um, there are some academic cultures where it's my lab, so anything that gets done in that lab has my name on it as the last author last being a position of honor and leadership. Um, I personally do not like that. In fact, I almost didn't accept my current job because the person who owned the Molecular Systematics Lab in 1993 told me that he had to be an author on all publications coming out of his lab. And so I called the director of the museum and I said, um, I want to accept the job, but you've got to take care of that person and help him to understand that we're not going to do business like that. Um, now, your advisor, that's an interesting one. It's a difficult one. For me, it's really strange. It's, a, it's one of those ramps that Arturo showed that went like red, white, green. If I'm really, really involved in, let's say, a thesis chapter with one of my students, and it was a really you know, vibrant collaboration, sure. If it's your thesis chapter, and I was maybe meeting with you once a week and you know, kind of guiding you, but not anything more than would be expected from a graduate advisor, there's no reason for me to be a co-author. And then when I'm really angry at a student because the student has been lazy or uninsightful or uncareful, then I will get in there and I will finish up the paper and get it out, sometimes because it needs to get out. And I'm on there as a co-author as punishment. And only the students and I know which of those two reasons is the case because I'm a co-author. So that's a little bit strange. My question is, did the advisor contribute more than is expected than just being your advisor? Because your advisor gets credit from having advised you. Now, I know that's not a common culture, even just within biodiversity science. Um, I think that takes kind of <coughs> clarity and perspective from the advisor to be able to say no. Jean. How do you decide on the order of the, of the authors? 
So order of authors is another, I think there might, no, okay. Um, order of authors is another big question. Um, in biodiversity science, generally first authorship is seen as best. Um, in other fields, last authorship is the position of honor. And so I kind of work with one foot in biodiversity and one foot in public health and disease questions. And so that actually works wonderfully because the public health people want to be last author and the biodiversity people want to be first author. And so all of a sudden you have two places of honor for two different authors. So that works very nicely. Um, it can be complicated, uh, but you can imagine there may be an intellectual leader, there may be a person who did, you know, kind of all of this level of stuff. Some people say that the person who wrote the paper should be first author. I don't think that's good either because sometimes the writing is this trivial thing at the end and it was, you know, five years of hard work to, you know, do that part of it. So it's a multi-dimensional decision. It's not easy. Um, when you have a lot of authors who did a lot of different things, sometimes it's better just to alphabetize. Um, we started randomizing in the niche modeling group because we had um, one student whose name began, last name began with B, and so she was going to be first author on all the papers. So we decided actually at her suggestion to randomize. Um, so no, no good decisions. Um, I've recently seen a situation where um, a country indicated that the corresponding author on impact rated publications gets, I think it was $1,000 of, um, of extra money. Huh? No. No. I, I think, I know in China there's a big bonus for science and nature publications. Uh, I don't know if there are other perks. But anyhow, all of a sudden, um, students in that country found their advisors saying, uh, I'll be corresponding author. 